You likely just learned that trigonometry only applies to right triangles. You know, for example, sine and cosine only work if one angle of a triangle is 90 degrees. Well, we're about to change all that because law of sines and law of cosines are special trigonometry rules that work even on non-right triangles, like acute and obtuse triangles. I'm going to show you how this is true, but before I do that, I want to lay the foundation for how we draw and identify triangles. It is the convention to label the angles of triangles with capital letters. As you see here, I have capital A, B, and C in the corners of the triangles indicating their angles. Across from each angle, there is its lowercase counterpart. The sides across from the angle are labeled with the lowercase of the letter used in the angle. So for across from angle B, which has a capital B, you'll see a lowercase b for a side b. Keep this in mind because when you're given a problem where the triangle illustration is not provided, you want to make sure that you draw the triangle first. Now that we understand that, let's go through law of sines and law of cosines, and I'm going to start with law of sines because it is the easier of the two. Law of sines is presented as sine of A over A equals sine of B over B equals sine of C over C. And while the law has three fractions forming a proportion, you know that to form a proportion you only need two ratios. So keep in mind that when you are dealing with law of sines, you would only be dealing with, for instance, A and B and not using C, or maybe you're dealing with B and C and not using A, or A and C and not using B. We use law of sines when we are given one known angle side pair. So maybe I'm given angle A and side A, and I'm also given angle B. Looking at this proportion, they would be asking me for side B, and with all proportions, when you're given three measurements and asked for the fourth, you know that you're setting up two ratios equivalent to each other. Lastly, before we move on to some specific examples involving law of signs, I just want to remind you of something that probably seems obvious but is something many students tend to forget when they're first learning this rule. Make sure that you put the sign in front of the angle of the proportion. So it says sine A over A, for instance, not just A over A. Um, again, minor detail that has a huge impact on the answer. Let's look at two examples where we are using law of sines because we have an angle side pair, but in each case we're asked for something different. In the first example, we'll be asked for an unknown side because we're given the angle across from it. And in the second example, we'll be asked for an unknown angle because we're given the side across from it. In any case, when you are not given the triangle, I suggest drawing it out first. This starts off with in triangle ABC, so I'm going to go ahead and draw out ABC, and I'm going to label what I'm given. So it says measure of angle A is 22, measure of angle C is 13, and measure of side A, come on, 13. Sorry, give me a second. There we go. And measure of angle, or side A, is 9, and I know side A is across from angle A, and they're asking me for the measure of side C. Since I'm dealing with A and C, I'm going to write out the proportion, sine A over A equals sine C over C. I do suggest that you write that out first as well, so that it's really easy to substitute things in. So sine of A, that's sine of 22, over side A, sine of C, sine of 13, over side C. And since we're solving for side C, we would just cross multiply. I like to use the zigzag method where I multiply the two that are across from each other. 9 times sine of 13, 33. Oh no, it is 13. I was right the first time. Over the one that's by itself, sine of 22, will equal what we're solving for. At this point, you can just go ahead and plug this into your calculator if they ask you for a rounded answer. Pay attention to how far they want you to round to. If they ask you for an exact answer, you would leave it like this. 
When I plug this into my calculator, I get that side C is 5.4. Before you submit this answer or move on to the next, I suggest that you ask yourself if it makes sense. We know in triangles that the bigger angle will be across from a bigger side. So it makes sense that because C is smaller, it is across from a side that is smaller than A. 5.4 is smaller than 9, so this measurement makes sense. It's also within the range of the numbers we're given. It's not like 504 or 0.54. It makes sense because the other side we were given is nine and they're about in the same range. Always ask yourself if this number is logical before you move on. In the next example involving law of signs, I am not given the triangle, so I'm gonna start by drawing it out and filling in what I'm given. Measure of angle A is 70. Side A, which is across from that, is 25. Side B, across from angle B, is 26. And I'm asked for the measure of angle B. Clearly in this proportion, I'm dealing with A and B. So I'm going to write out my proportion. Sine of A over A is equal to sine of B over B. Now that I have it written out, it's pretty easy for me to fill it in. Angle A is 70. Side A is 25. We do not know angle B, but I do know side B. This looks like an inequality. I didn't intend for that, sorry. And since I'm solving for angle B, I'm going to go ahead and multiply the ones that are across from each other first. So 26 times sine of 70 divided by the one that's by itself equal to sine of B. Notice I did not write sine of 70 times 26. My calculator would multiply the 70 and 26 first according to order of operations and then take the sine of that, which is not true. So make sure that if you are multiplying sine or cosine or tangent by something, you put it in the front. Entering this into my calculator, I see that sine of B is equal to 0.977 approximately. And using my sine rules, I know that I can get an angle out of sine by doing inverse sine. So I'm going to inverse sine both sides. Inverse sine of sine makes it go away. And then I have inverse sine of the other side. And I see that angle B is 77.8 if I was being asked to round to the tenths place. Stop and make sure that that makes sense. Side B is a little bigger than side A, so it makes sense that angle B would be a little bigger than angle A, so that's logical. Now that we've looked at law of sines in both cases, where we're either given an angle and asked for a side, or given a side and asked for an angle, let's go take a look at the harder one of the two laws, law of cosines. Law of cosines is provided to you generally as the first rule, but I do want you to see how all three of these rules are connected to the first. So the first rule says side A squared equals side B squared plus side C squared minus 2 times BC times cosine of angle A. Notice that if we start with side A, we don't see the letter A again until the end in its angle form. Instead, we see BC, BC. The same applies for the next rule. If we start with side B, we do not see the letter B again until the end in its angle form, capital B. Instead, we see AC, AC. And the same for the last rule. If we start with side C, we do not see C again until it's in its angle form, capital C. We see B, A, B, A, B. Lots of C's going on here. When we're dealing with law of cosines, an uh, indicator to let us know this is the rule we should be using is if we have an angle adjacent to two known sides. For instance, if I know angle A and I know side B and side C, that would indicate to me to use law of cosines. I do not have an angle side pair here. Or if I know three sides, so I know side A, side B, and side C. Again, no angle side pair, so I have to use law of cosines. 
Just like with Law of Sines, I do want to caution you about a few things. Notice that this last term in the polynomial expression, all of those terms are being multiplied together. So 2 times b times c times cosine of a. Keep that in mind when you are solving and use your order of operations. Just like with Law of Sines, let's look at two examples. One case where we're solving for an unknown side and one case where we're solving for an unknown angle. In both of them, we're going to always start out by drawing the triangle if it's not provided. They tell me that I have triangle A, B, C. I'm given angle B. I'm given side A across from angle A and side C across from angle C. See, I do not have an angle side pair, so this is why I'm using law of cosines. Because I'm being asked to solve for side B, I'm going to use this rule. And just like with law of sines, I suggest you write it out. Makes it much easier when you're substituting in, so you don't have so much to hold in your head. For substituting, just put in what you are given. of 97. And honestly, at this point, you could just plug this directly into your calculator. So you could do 16 squared plus 25 squared minus 2 times 16 times 25 times cosine 97. Enter. <laughs> because the variable is already isolated, you can go ahead and just throw that all into your calculator in one long stream. When you do that, you're going to get something like 978 0.5, but that's what b squared is equal to, so to solve for b, I have to square root both sides, and I see that b, if it's rounded to the tenths place, is 31.3. Just like with the law of sines, think about does that make sense. In this triangle, b will be the biggest angle, so it makes sense that side b will be the biggest side, so this is logical. It's also within the range of the other numbers. It's not way off. Let's look at the other example involving law of cosines where we're solving for the unknown angle. We will be having to use inverse sine to isolate the angle here. But just like with law of sines, we start by drawing the triangle. They tell me triangle ABC, so I'm going to label everything out. They tell me side A, which is across from angle A, is 10. Side B is 17 and side C is 11. See here we do not have an angle side pair, so I'm using law of cosines, and I'm being asked to solve for angle C. So I'm going to use the one that starts with C, because it's the only one that has angle C in it. Go ahead and substitute in what you know. What you're going to notice here is it's going to be more challenging than the last one because we do not have the variable isolated. So we have to be very careful with our order of operations on this one. I'm going to simplify as much as I can. This is 289 minus... When I was warning you about how the last expression in this equation is all being multiplied together, what I was warning you against is don't do 100 plus 289 minus 340. That 340 is stuck to that cosine of C, so we can't subtract it. We can combine these two together, however. Bring everything else down. We can subtract the 389 from both sides. And now to get rid of that negative 340, we divide both sides by negative 340. They're not asking us for cosine of C, they want just C. So we're going to inverse cosine both sides. I'm going to inverse cosine the 0.79, and inverse cosine of cosine just leaves me with the angle C. When I plug that in, I get a pretty long decimal, 
So to round this, I'm just going to round to 38. Make sure that makes sense. Angle B should be our biggest angle because it's across from the biggest side. C is the medium one, and this is a medium value, so it makes sense. In the last two examples, we were asked to solve for just one thing, solve for side B or solve for angle C. But sometimes you're asked to solve the triangle. If that's the case, and you see that you do not have an angle side pair, go ahead and start with law of cosines to solve for one thing. For example, in the first problem, you can solve for side B. And then once you have that, you now have an angle side pair. You knew angle B, you just solved for side B, and since you now have an angle side pair, forget law of cosines, we're going back to law of sines. Use that to solve for angle A or angle C, and then subtract those two angles from 180 to get the third. What I mean is you don't have to use law of cosines multiple times when you're solving a triangle. You generally, if you have to use it at all because you don't have an angle side pair, only need to use it one time. Then you now have an angle side pair and you can go back to law of sines to do the rest. I'm going to include a PDF um, down below so that you have all of these rules out on the first page. This first page is a good thing to print out and keep in your binder as a reference. You also will have the second page with the examples and you can try them again on your own and make sure you get the same answers I got that so you know that this information stuck with you.